Welcome back, everybody, to the Prescriber Truth Podcast right here on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash prescribe truth. I'm Jamal Bandy. If this is your first time watching the show, please remember to subscribe if you find this content helpful. And you can listen to this on your various podcast apps, including iTunes, Stitch Radio, and Google Play. If you'd like to support the show financially, you can do so um, by donating to the link below in the description or partner with me on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash prescribe truth. Uh, for anywhere a dollar a month, you really do help the show out a lot. And I really appreciate it. If not, I appreciate your prayer. Um, today, I want to um start um like breaking this down. Like I don't know if you can see it good. I'm gonna show it to you. Start breaking this down. This is uh, Eric Mason's book, Woke Church. Um, I started reading this probably about a week ago. I got it on the second. Oh no, it's been longer than I've been on this for about, huh, I didn't know it's been that long. Um, about seven, well, 15 days, a couple weeks now. And I'm on chapter, I'm finishing up, well, I just finished up chapter three. So I've really been trying to take my time with this book. Um, very interesting, very interesting. And so, um, what I seek to do tonight is to give a brief um, summarization, I guess, of my thoughts on a few things. Few points that were made in this book, and I hope it'd be helpful for you. Um, give it a read yourself, or see what you think about it. I don't know. Depends on well, depends on what side of the spectrum you're on. If you're um, on the side that advocates for social justice in the sense of um, Marxism, then you're you know you may not want to be called a Marxist or whatnot. But there are some points in here that really do point to that that ideology, and um, if you're on the side where you kind of go against Marxism or um, so this issue with social justice as far as how it's um, line, um, then you'll find it interesting to understand what the thinking behind everything is concerning this, uh, the idea of being woke. So this, is, this has been helpful. Um, Eric Mason, I respect a great deal. Um, I have his book back in biblical manhood um and uh man he's he's been a blessing to me everything i mean i i really do look up to him um but this well over lately especially this issue um there have been a lot that has been problematic under what he has said and also we'll go on this book but not getting into all of that uh the idea of today's show is to give some points about this book that i found that were interesting to say the least and that i would like for people who listen to this who may disagree with me uh, would give comments oh so, and we'll give some feedback and uh, we can have a dialogue i've been saying for the longest since i've been doing a few videos dealing with the issue behind social justice and gospel and whatnot that we need to have this conversation it needs to continue we need to need to um have the conversation amongst people who disagree with us and um have a peaceful conversation on one that's not going to get volatile or cause people to want to uh distance themselves from each other and all that kind of stuff because of ego and whatnot to have an honest conversation because these are some serious uh things that are being said on both sides that um yeah that re requires our, our attention but it does anyway uh, without further ado let's let's just jump right on in so i'm going to be kind of speed through this guy um We'll start with the forwards. Uh, he had two forwards here, one by uh, John Perkins, and the other one by uh, well, by Megan Duncan. So now, I, what I found problematic turning the uh, forward that um, Perkins gave is he gave a backstory, um, so letting us know who he is and what brought him to reali the realization that he's under now concerning being woke or um, issue of social justice. And in that second, within that, well, towards the end of the second paragraph, he tells this story, um, which on the surface is really good. I mean, it's, it's nothing that, like, I mean, it kind of tugs at your heartstrings a little bit. I'm going to read this paragraph to you. Now, this is on page 13. This is on the forward. So we haven't even gotten to the book yet. And he gives this story. Uh, he says, my mother died when I was seven months old, and the police killed my brother when I was a boy. But it wasn't until I was badly beaten in a Brandon jail that I saw the absolute necessity for reconciliation, racial reconciliation. It was there that I saw the depth of racism. I wanted nothing to do with white people after that. 
But while I recovered in the hospital, white doctors and nurses cared for me, washing my wounds and loving me. We were healing each other. That's when I prayed, Lord, I want to preach a gospel that can reconcile, that brings blacks and whites together in one body. Now, I, under, I highlighted this line and I underlined when he said a gospel and reconcile because uh, from my understanding of the gospel message is that it does reconcile. The true gospel, I mean, what, like, what do you think like, the, the New Testament is about? You know what I'm saying? Like, um, being in in turn, reconcile where we are like brothers, sisters, in one body, um, worshiping one Lord. And um, so we are reconciled in Christ. But he says he wants to preach a gospel. And my thing is, I was thinking, like, well, is there is the gospel that we have through the scriptures not already a gospel that can reconcile? Now, I can understand if he's meaning that there are people in this day that, that was, wasn't preaching the true gospel. And maybe that was the only gospel he was familiar with was a false gospel. But then I can understand that. I can understand it. But he doesn't bring that to bear in his forward. He says he wants to preach a gospel that can reconcile. So obviously the gospel is being preached, but his gospel is not somehow bringing people together. And so, but if it's the true gospel, then it's not a gospel. You just want to preach the gospel. And that's the thing I didn't get about that line. It's like, it sounded really good, but on the surface, I mean, but when you dig deeper into it, it's like, we already have a gospel that can reconcile, that brings multiple ethnicities together. You know, so yeah, so it's unfortunate that racism exists, but it exists. You know, so it's like yeah, these issues, they are real issues, you know, but that doesn't mean the gospel that we already have isn't sufficient, you know, to save hearts. I mean, that's what the gospel is, the power of God for salvation. And what, it, what, does it, what happens when we're saved, when we're brought into right standing with the Lord through Christ? Like our hearts change. So that hatred that we have and that, bigotry we have and all that stuff that we may have in us is washed by the blood of the lamb and so or being washed that's what sanctification is if it's not if it didn't happen automatically it, it happens over time and so like that's what sanctification is and so um yeah, that's very, like, i put a big question mark on that like why why is not the gospel now that can do that why has it be a different gospel and um uh, many other in this forward, but um, I want to jump. I guess I'm going to go over some points, but I found that that'd be a question. Now, the overarching theme in this scene so far, in the first three chapters, that is, is that um, the sitting around Ephesians five fourteen, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And that seems to be the verse that be the driving force behind this book, um, or the idea of being woke. As far as what Eric Mason would say in the chapter, I mean, chapter one. And, um, yeah, I, you know, the, the context of that verse dealing with believers, you know, talking about how basically how they're, you know, they, even though they're being made, even though they're made alive, they're still wanting to dabble in sin, you know. And so it seems to me if this is the idea of woke, then you would need to be Christian. But we're going to see later, which I'm going to, I don't know, I'm probably going to break this video up in like, um, or this session into like two different videos or two different weeks ago. I got a lot to say on this. And I've been kind of keeping it in for all these days. But, um, but yeah, it's like the idea of woke, it seems like you wouldn't have this concept of woke for anybody who's an unbeliever. But um, Dr. Eric Mason, he's going to make a concept for woke that would seem he was more woke than Christian. Which um, I'll give my, my thoughts on that later. Uh, but Ligon Duncan's for it was very interesting to me as well. And um, just to give a point out of here, it says uh, talk, he talks about his time going to um, being over a seminary or teaching in a seminary, and he says at 29 he was to teach systematic theology at Reformed Theological Seminary in the summer of 1990. Now mind the date of that, 1990. The very first course I was asked to teach was pastoral and social ethics. Now, which you may ask, social issues did I choose to address in this course? Abortion, heck. Homosexuality, heck. Marriage, divorce and remarriage, heck. Medical ethics, meaning infertility, end of life issues, etc., heck. Just war, check. Death penalty, check. 
but what about racism? Um, no. And that's literally his word. Um, no. It did not even occur to me that this was a pastoral issue that I needed to prepare future ministers to address biblically in the church, much less in the communities where they would serve. So, let's think about it for a second. Why wasn't racism a part of one of the source or one of the courses to the seminary? Well, one, because race is not a biblical concept. We don't believe there are multiple races. We believe we're all in a one race, and we're different ethnicity. You know, saying so when you deal with social ethics, I mean, as a Christian, if you're at a Christian seminary, as a Christian, we should know how to love one another. If we have a problem with loving our neighbor as ourselves, then that's a sin issue which should be addressed, right? But there are people who have different views on abortion, which Christians really shouldn't, you know, to value human life, right? Homosexuality, believe it or not, there's a lot of issues within the church. There are some people that and think it's okay, or you can be a gay Christian, and so on and so forth. And so there's a lot of issues here. Marriage, divorce, remarriage. How many conversations or debates are there about can you remarry after divorce, or when is it okay to divorce? You know, A, B, and C, or when to marry, when not to marry, so on and so forth. Medical ethics. Infertility, you know, should you take birth control? Which kind of take or don't take? I mean, all these are issues that we all deal with, and there are debates on. There's no debate in racism. There's, there's no issue in that. Like, you shouldn't be racist. You know, like, no, nobody will ever say, you know, the person would say, hey, under the circumstance, it's okay to be a racist. No. You know, so that goes into loving our neighbor. So, I mean, I don't see that as a shock that, of course, that won't be taught. But look going further into what he said here, um, and this is page fifteen. It says, "It he said, um, how in the world could I have missed that? How could I have been so utterly blind to my context? How did a sin that had pervaded my whole world growing up, not even turn the page, not even register to me as something to help just address?" Especially considering that many of them, and I underline this because it's significant to me, many of them, remember this is around 1990, many of them were going to minister in places where overt racism in the church, I, and he put, he, he, and on brackets, majority white churches denying membership to black Christians. And he says this stuff was still an ongoing reality. See what I mean? Not woke. Now, with that, I'm like, whoa, in the 1990s, majority of white churches denying membership to blacks? I would really like to, if somebody out there, please, can start, can cite to me some kind of source that shows that, approves that, because um, I really don't believe that. Not during that time. I mean, that was a time when that was that did happen. That's why we had the AM, right? But in the 1990s, no one? I don't remember that being the case. That you go to a, a if I was to step to a majority white church, then I would be denied membership. You know, maybe just in my city, but I like to know where. But those he said majority white churches deny membership to black Christians. That means that's that's more than just one church. So not just your church in your city that happen to do that very wrong way of doing church, but a lot of them, a whole heap of them, are denying. Black Christians membership. I would really like to see that, and it was still an ongoing reality. Yeah, I, you know, I'd like to see that. Um, so if somebody could point that to me, if you, if you witness that, not just witness that, but if you trust me, some churches that doc, that's documented that they've done that, practice that, a, whole, a bunch of them, please do. That would really help out a lot, as far as my understanding of that line. Now, then he talks about how, you know, why the Eric Mason choose him for the board, you know, was it worthy of the A, B, and C? Um, but towards the end, well, well, almost towards the end of his forward, he talks about, I hate, I want to have to read this whole paragraph, but I'm not going to read the whole paragraph. But, um, let me start towards the end of, of this paragraph. He says, I suggested that race, that racial tensions in our churches and our nation will be in a significantly better state if the reformed community in America in the 19th century or the 19th and 20th centuries had simply rightly applied the second great commandment. And I agree with that. I agree with that. You know, a lot of the issues from back then and so on and so forth, a lot of, a lot of Christians who were in churches, so on and so forth, and, uh, a lot of them dropped ball. They did. 
I mean, I mean that's reality. Oh, no, that's a fact. You know, they will call themselves Christians, yet for some reason couldn't love these image bearers of God. They did see them as human, and some of them didn't. You know, there was a debate whether slave whether slavery should continue or don't continue. Then after that, could they should they read or don't read? All this stuff. Um, but while there were um, professed Christians denying um, blacks freedom and denying them to read and so on and so forth, there were Christians who were fighting for the rights of blacks to be able to read, fighting for the rights of blacks to be free, and so on and so forth. You had both of this going on at the time. It wasn't like all of the um, South was against blacks and all of the North. It was, you know, it was a mixed bunch, but you had a majority. Yep, you had a majority. But, you know, it shows that that gospel that um, Perkins talked about, that did exist even back then during the 19th century. That gospel, the true gospel, was being preached. You know, just just like now, there are people who profess to be Christians and don't practice what they preach a lot of the time. You know, they call bad teachers, false teachers in some instances. You know, and so, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I, I agree with that line. Um, he says, uh, but tragically, the reformed community, my community, my people, needs to limit its application. Now, I put on here, question mark, how and when. So we're talking about reformed community. Now, I, I hate blanket statement. And, you know, even on both sides. I don't blanket statements on both sides. Because you'll say, well, within that reformed community, you have anomalies. You have people who didn't go along with that, so on and so forth. But that's that is so that's so blanketed, you know. Like, okay, the reform community, my community, devised ways to limit its application. So, how are ways devised to limit its application? Now we know what happened, you know, it's slavery and the anti labor relation laws and so on and so forth. Like those things are reality; those things happen, so on and so forth. But keep in mind, also, Ligon Duncan is talking about you know, the twentieth century as well. This would include the 1990s and so on and so forth. So yeah, we have we have a whole a couple of centuries here where a lot has happened in the midst of all that civil rights movement, so on and so forth, and a lot has changed, you know. Um, but somehow, even today, whatever those changes were, still not enough. And so, devise ways to limit its application. And I'm like, well, what does that mean for today? Like, yes, I mean, we can look back at them, we can see. Yeah, man. Um, there are people who devise some things, put laws in place, and so on and so forth. But I mean, were they really all the reform community? You know, I mean, it was it was it really was it really like that, that way? Was it really like that? And I I don't know. I find a hard find a hard time really, really taking that. You know, and, and I said this before in another video of mine. I'm a black man. I find it hard when somebody links all black people into one group. Well. So black people, so black folk, they like this. Black folk, they just do that. You know, I don't like that. That's blanket statement. Like, no, I'm not. I'm not that way. I, you know, I resent that. So I'm, I'm like that across the board. I'm not just with this issue. Um, you know, I feel like you should deal with things on an individual basis. You know, who did it? When? So what's the evidence of that? And they are wrong. Therefore, we can call a person to account. Hey, they were wrong for them devising the plan. But the reform community, there, like I said. There were a lot of people, and it wasn't just one or two people. It was a lot of people who were against all these limitations, all these things. They were against it, you know? So, yeah, I found an issue with that. Um, second to the last paragraph on page 17, uh, he says, There are many people out there today speaking to the issues addressed in this book, social justice issues, right? but they are doing so in unbiblical, uninformed, and unwise ways. Now, before I even start reading the book, I'm led to believe that Dr. Eric Mason, he's doing it in a biblical, informed, and wise way. That's what I'm led already to do because like Duncan giving his step of approval saying that there are other people who are doing this topic and they're not doing it right. Eric Mason is. So, now I'm going to challenge that idea as we go into chapter 1. He says many well. He said many, even well-meaning Christians, are speaking to these issues in ways that unnecessarily divide and confuse. So I'm led to believe that when I read in chapter one and so on and forth, I'm not going to be confused, and I'm not going to see where he's actually trying to bring division. 
That's that's what I'm saying. I read this forward. I'm like, okay, all right, let's go. And that's, that's what I love about critical thinking because I can read this book in an unbiased way and read it as if I'm new to this subject, as if I ain't heard nothing on it. I'm a, I'm a Christian and born again believer. I'm reading this to see what is Eric Mason saying about the woke church. What does that look like? You know, not bringing my biases to the table. And when I read it, I'm not supposed to walk away confused. I'm not supposed to walk away as if he's trying to bring division unnecessarily. And I'm going to be led to believe that he's going to come from a biblical, informed, and wise way about this. That's what he says in his last line of this paragraph. Dr. Mason's voice is one trying to bring us together. And so that's, that was my points on the forward that I had underlined and really found um, need to really address. Of course, that's not all within the forge that I could have said, uh, which I know there are other people who use on this. They have a lot more to say about the forge than me, but those are things that really stuck out to me, and I'll leave it at that. Now, um, as I go to chapter one real quick, like I said, I'm already on this thing a while now, so like I said, I'm not going to go a whole lot. Matter of fact, I'm going to do um, probably a portion of it, but there's one part that I got this whole page marked up. So um, I'm gonna split this video. I'm gonna I'm gonna do uh this first portion of this um chapter. Um, a couple points I'm gonna bring out on here, and then I'm gonna save it for next time. All right, that give people time to respond and continue the conversation. So in chapter one, it starts off saying, well, really this the chapter one starts off the first section of the book. The first section of the book says, "Be aware." So the, the chapter one is titled, "The Church Already Be Woke." Now, given the context of using Ephesians 5.14, I would assume that the church is woke because we're dead in our sins, raised to life. And he's going to bring that up in, in this chapter. We're raised to life. So Christians, we are woke. If you want to go that far, we're awake. We're alive. And we're in, in contrast to being dead, which the rest of the world is that don't know Christ. Um, but without reading line by line of this, um, this first paragraph or so, he speaks, he uses uh, a volcano to give an illustration of how racism is. He talks about how this volcano, it lies dormant uh, for some time. It doesn't, it doesn't erupt and everything else. People get comfortable. They live their lives and so on and so forth. And one day, it erupts and, you know, there's damage. People may lose their lives, so on and so forth. You know, but it just happens. When it happens, it's big. Well, he says, he basically likens that to how racism is. It lies underneath. Lies for some time we've, we've gone through some years and stuff where hey things are cool we're smooth selling everybody's living life then one day a series of events happen he uses the charge shooting well uh, where um dylan uh yeah dylan roof dylan roof went and shot up the black uh eight people in the black church as they were worshiping having bible study and he used that as the uh, eruption so like you have this and he and things like that after that happened, people get killed by police officers. So and so forth. some of them are unjust and some are in question and so on and so forth. So you have all these things happening and it's just big and it explodes. Now there's all this this issue of racism comes up again and now, hey, it's an issue. We gotta deal with it. So he's the issues of racism and injustice are like that um Pelua, Pele, I may pronounce that name of that volcano really wrong. But that volcano, in a lot of ways, they form a hotbed of lava that lives just beneath the surface. And at any moment, they can explode violently, as happened in Charleston, South Carolina, when Dylan went into a black church and gunned down 10 worshipers. I say eight, but 10 worshipers. He says, or these issues can fuel the subtle microaggressions that minorities experience on a daily basis, like being ignored when they go into shops for service or being followed because people assume they are stealing. Now, I, I, you know, like I said, I may just be an anomaly. You know, and I know other blacks that don't feel through this, but you're talking about microaggression. It's like these are things like trying to find like like you like trying to find conflict in areas where there may not be conflict. You know, I walk in the store, man, there's sometimes I walk into a store and a black person ignores me. I mean I'm like I'm like, hey how you doing? And they be like And they work there. I'm like <laughs> Customer service, maybe even a little bit. You know, I mean, there's there are times when I, I be around blacks, and it's like 
they got that special, the special look, especially older ones. Like, I don't got Especially when I was, especially when I was like, what, 17 or so? I mean, oh yeah, them Indians too. Them Indians would do it too. <laughs> I mean, it, like, like we all, everybody does that. The thing is, is it always because of race? Or maybe it's because they had an experience. People stealing from their store. You know, at this, at this location, you got majority black people stealing from their store. So, of course, it's going to be suspicious. I would be suspicious. If I, if I own a business and neighborhood, and I know that I've been robbed a couple of times, or I know there's robberies taking place, and the the um, description of these robbers are young African-American men, then I'm going to wonder, when I see somebody come in my store, if, am I going to be robbed today? Because that's what's going on. You know, so it don't necessarily have to be because of racism, you know what I'm saying, or because of the color of the skin. But, now, it could be. I mean, there are instances where it could be. I'm not denying that these things happen. But to say that it's always the case, I don't know. People have, their, people have paranoia, you know? Um, yeah, so being ignored with shops of service, I mean, people have people can have a bad day. I mean, it could be anything. Like, why does it have to be race? If it's a white person, is it only because they're white? Like if a white person does it, do I take it as being racist? But when I see a black person does it to me, I should take it as them just being upset or having a bad day. Like, why can't I take that for the white guys as well? You know, so, I mean, I, don't, I mean, there have there have been ways where whites can make it known that they're very racist, and there are ways that blacks can make it known that they're very racist. But is is should I assume that just off of a look or uh, uh being ignored? Or happen they happen to be watching me closely in a store, you know. And matter of fact, we be honest, they just steal. I it, it was justified to follow me in the store. Matter of fact, that's how I got caught stealing, because I was a young black kid walking through Walmart, and the um the, they they used to dress up like regular people. I forgot what they call them. So they dressed up like regular people, and they and you know, they they see you looking suspicious and follow you. And he followed me right in the bathroom while I was trying to steal them DVDs. I remember, <laughs> and I got caught. I got caught, you know what I'm saying? I ain't go to jail, you know? I was too young, but I was saying, like, y'all 15 at the time when that happened, you know? But I know, but, I mean, that's how it was justified. But why are they following me? Why? Maybe because there are other young black kids like myself going to the store and stealing. And I happened to be one of them that was actually doing it. See? So no, I don't find a problem with that. I don't find an issue with that. I find them doing their job. That's what they're supposed to do. They're trying to protect their investment. They're trying to, you know, do their job. Um. Now, and this last point I'm gonna make before I end this this section, and this is only on page twenty-two. This this is only the second page into the first chapter, and he goes. He brings up Ephesians five thirteen to fourteen. He says. Everything exposed by the light is made visible, but what makes everything visible is light. For it is said, get up, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Or some translators say, awake, O sleeper. Then he makes this, trying to make a connection. He says, when Paul talks about everything being exposed by the light, this doesn't merely mean to see something that was hidden. It is deeper than that. The word for exposed means rebuke, expose, refute. No one's fault, implying that there there is a convincing of that fault. When Paul is saying what Paul is saying is that the gospel strengthens us through the spirit to see things in our society that others do not. That's not what Paul is saying there. That's not what Paul is saying. There. I mean, yeah, I mean, yes, we do. I mean, that's, so that's like it's a true statement. We do. Because the Christ opens our eyes, we the Holy Spirit opens our eyes, and we can see we see the world differently. Now that we have we have a different world view because we're born again believers. You know, so yes, a Christian we see the world differently than what the, than how the rest of the world will see it, right? But that text of scripture is not we talk about things that are being exposed to come to the light. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about us, we're talking about our own sin, our own issues, not things necessarily in our society, but us individually. As believers, exposed by the light. He said, this doesn't merely mean to see something that was hidden. And it, so what Paul is saying is that the gospel strengthens us through the spirit to see things in our society that others do not. We are called as the people of God to wake up, to see what others call it out. The church in America is not awake through 
reality of what is happening in communities across this nation. And we are missing out on our calling to shine the light into these places of darkness for Christ's glory. And I love how he, as he breaks the scripture out to basically prove, to make his point and make his connection. And so I put like a mark there and I was like, hey, what's the connection? Like, why are you trying to connect this scripture to what you're saying here? You're basically saying that you are supposed to be speaking out on issues, so injustices, so on and so forth. And we're missing opportunities by not doing it. Um, and so it ought to be light in a, in a in this world of darkness, right? And cool, got that. But that's not what that scripture is talking about. I mean, there are other scriptures that talk about how we should be a light that shine in dark places. How you know, no one takes a lamp and puts it under the bed because it doesn't shine a light. It doesn't shine a light. It doesn't light the room. So you put the light out. You put it out so therefore it can light the room. So yes, as Christians, yeah, we want we want to be out there. We want to. Go and proclaim Christ. Bring this light, shine this light forth throughout this world. So that's what that's what that's what we want to do. That's what we should want to do. But to make the connection between the scripture and that, um, I I don't see how that connection is made. The scripture's not talking about that. But um, I find the issue also with this narrative. I make my point, and we can continue the conversation later. But it says how the church in America is not awake to the reality of what is happening in communities across this nation. But we are missing out on our calling to shine the light into these places of darkness for Christ's glory. I'm going to read, now read this last paragraph to finish my point. CNN released an exclusive report in October 2017 titled, People for Sale, Where Lives Are Auctioned for $400. A team of their reporters traveled to Libya and witnessed smugglers auctioning off 12 migrant men as slaves, some for no more than $400. This modern-day slavery sprang up in recent years when the Libyan Coast Guard started cracking down on refugees fleeing the country for Europe. Smugglers suddenly had a backlog of refugees on their, on their hands and began selling them as slaves. The reporters learned of at least nine other locations in the country where these auctions were taking place. Now, the reason why I'm stopping there is because he goes into a lot there. Um, dealing with the reaction that his, his son had and how we should feel in these areas and so on and so forth. But if this is what it's about, if being awake is dealing with issues in our societies and, and speaking out on these things and so on and so forth, I have a I have something I want to say to that. So I've been saying this in a few conversations I've had with other brothers who disagree with me on this. I haven't gotten a response, so maybe somebody out there can give me a response. They hear this. In the New Testament, the injustices that Rome was doing with the Jews and everyone else. I mean, you're talking about 400 years or so of injustice. I mean, people being hung on spikes and burned, like drenched in oil and burned, and they, they lit the streets. All these injustices. What was the response of the first and early church? against and spoke out against these issues you know and so i'm not saying that they they should have or should have what i'm saying is if if that is if a, if not speaking out on these things or going out there and making it making this the thing the central thing that we deal with as far as knowing what's going on in society and and uh making a point to speak out on those things if, but if in the lack of doing so is not really shining christ's light then I don't think our apostles that we follow in the scriptures, uh, they didn't shed no light. Not like they should have. Because Paul didn't speak against any injustice of Rome, and they were, it was going on during this time. A lot of Christians were killed. Stephen was martyred unjustly. What happened when he was stoned? When Stephen was stoned, who stood up and spoke, up, spoke out against that? I mean, Paul, Paul wasn't a, born, a believer then. He was Saul then. Which of the believers stopped it? Stood in the way. Said, no, you're not going to stone him. I stand in his way. It's unjust. Wrong. After it happened, who would have protested the, um, those people who were in authority? That they should, they should get fired at A, B, and C. When Peter was locked up, unjustly, he was locked up for preaching Christ. What did the saints do? The saints didn't go, they didn't go to the jailhouse and they didn't protest the jailhouse. They didn't. They were at home praying. Praying, it was the Lord who freed Peter, met them at his house. 
You know, so I'm like, if that is, if he's saying that the church in America is not awake to the reality of what is happening in communities across this nation, and we are missing out on our calling to shine the light into these places of darkness for Christ's glory, if, so if we're missing out on that because we're not, like dealing with social these social issues in his way, in the way that he's going to bring out now the p mind, I haven't even gotten to what he considers social issues we should be dealing with. You know, and so that that's that's um <laughs> that it needs to be dealt with, that needs to be brought out. So I ain't even gotten to the to what the issues are that he actually thinks that we should be out there um dealing with. But if that's the case, if the lack of if that's the case that we're not shining light, then we have a, we have bad examples in the testament for that, especially not apostles. And um but I you know, I doubt that. I doubt that Eric Mason would say that, and I doubt any Christian would say like, "Yeah, they didn't, they didn't find the light, they didn't have it together." And I'm saying like, none of them were perfect, you know. What I'm saying? But the apostles, I mean, they laid the foundation. We do follow their example, especially in the scriptures, you know. So, yeah, I would, I would like to hear something on that. Somebody, you show me in the scriptures, maybe where I'm, I'm wrong in that, where I missed it on that. Um, I would, I would appreciate that, really would. But um, I'm gonna stop there. Uh, I've gone long enough. I ain't, like I said, I ain't even gotten through the first chapter. But this is just a, a once, uh, so we'll this until uh, we get through it. This is, uh, I say, this is a what bits of one video out of many as I go through this first part of this book, and it's a lot to talk about. So anyway, I hope this be beneficial for you. Please stay tuned. Uh, subscribe if you haven't already. The next week until I go over uh, the next few pages. Stop the page 22 with you guys today. If you found this helpful, please like, share, and subscribe. Check out more videos from Prescribed Truth on the side. And remember, in a world full of errors, the only thing the doctor prescribes is truth.